are listening to the Slash and Cast Podcast Network. Enjoy the show. <laughs> All right, folks, Justin here with a quick word before we dive in. This episode features myself and Angelique, and we chat with veteran stage and screen actor Martin Metcalf about theater, Animal House, Twisted Sister, Seinfeld, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and more. And I promise I'm not going to keep harping on this, but just a quick note in regards to the audio quality issues that I addressed in the last episode. Some of you brought the issues to my attention. We've dealt with them, but unfortunately, we still have several episodes that were pre-recorded before we were able to locate and ultimately fix the issue. So they may be present in this one, though I've done some extra cleaning up. So hopefully it's not quite as noticeable as before. But anyway, just to let you know, the episodes that are being recorded now will not have these issues. And I'll be sure to let you know when those start rolling out. Anyway, I'm going to shut up now. Without further ado, here you go. Boils and ghouls, this is your comrade, the Crypt Keeper here, reporting dead from the sanctuary of the strange. Tonight's macabre myth is a fright-filled feature, one overflowing with monsters, madness, and magic. <laughs> You're a kid. What sort of things are you into? You're reading books, watching movies, you're building forts. My grandfather used to send me an Archie comic and or a Donald Duck comic every week, rolled up and wrapped in brown paper. And then with his great, he, he wrote with a fountain pen, a blue ink and a fountain pen. And he wrote my name on it. I got one of those every week. So comic books, baseball cards. I collected baseball cards. I didn't read a lot. I was lived outdoors most of the time. Yeah, what else? Yeah, I played a lot of a lot of soccer, kickball, a lot of cowboys and Indians. I'm old enough that we played cowboys and Indians back then. <laughs> I was always an Indian. See, what else was I into? Oh, I had good dogs. Always had good dogs. Yeah, that was it. I didn't I didn't know anything about the theater or about acting or about show business at all. I never went to a play. Never went. Well, we used to go to the Ozark movie theater and neck in the back uh, in the back couple of rows with Jane McGreevy. The first movie I remember seeing and being really scared by was Rodan, that old, uh, that Japanese movie, Rodan. Yeah, it came, yeah. Out of, uh, came out of the Godzilla thing. That I remember crouching, hiding behind the chair in front of me watching Rodan. <laughs> and, and I remember Jimmy Stewart in the FBI story. Those are my <laughs> earliest movie memories. Those are good ones to have. Well, Jimmy Stewart's a good one to have, and yeah. Rodan, those are great. Yeah. My son watches, my son, who's 27 and, and in law school right now, still occasionally will watch a Godzilla movie and loves them. They're great. Those are classics. Yeah. Around what age would you say that you started taking an interest in the arts? Oh, not until I was a sophomore in college. Yeah, I went to college as an engineer. My dad had been an engineer. I was really good at math and sciences and all that stuff and got pretty good grades all through junior high school and high school and got accepted at the University of Michigan in the engineering school. And I went to engineering school and it wasn't all that interesting. And then my roommate in my sophomore year at, uh, what was it, Markley Hall, I think it was called where we lived. He said, come on with me. We're going to go audition for these plays that they're doing at the theater department. They're doing all three parts of Henry the Sixth, and he was he considered himself an actor. The girls are really friendly in the theater department. That's what he said. <laughs> so, uh, so I went. Of course, that was all I needed to hear that the girls were really friendly in the theater department. I went and I was cast in fifteen different roles in the three these three full length Shakespeare plays that they did uncut. Professor Halstead really was a Shakespearean scholar and and devotee, and he. Uh, didn't cut anything. I played 15 parts 
Most of them had one line, a couple had maybe three lines. You know, I'd run in and say, the enemy is over the hill <laughs> and stuff like that. I had I did 13 different makeup changes. I'd do putty noses and, and black eyes and all kinds of stuff. And I really got caught by it. I got, uh, I was hooked. I was right. I'd never, I'd been in this family of engineers and, and uh, school teachers and librarians, and it was pretty dry. And there I was in the theater with all these people going, yeah, screaming and yelling and falling in love one second and, and beating somebody up the next second. It was just, it was madness and it was great. I loved it. How long were you doing theater when you started to take it serious and maybe think, hey, I could make this a career? Well, that's interesting too, because I, I was in, I graduated college 68, 1968 and Vietnam was still going on. And the draft was still going on. And so I was eligible for the draft. I couldn't get into graduate school. I tried because my grades weren't good enough. I was just, all I did was plays. So I just uh, hit the road. I went out to Haight-Ashbury and California and ended up up in Oregon and just wandered around trying to avoid going to the draft. Finally had to go to the draft and got out of that. They didn't want me. They saw that I was kind of crazy. I was doing a, a, a fair amount of, of drugs, but just, you know, marijuana acid now and then again. And when I good could stuff. get my hands on it. Yeah. Yeah. The, the good stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The therapeutic stuff, the medicinal right. stuff, all exactly. for medicinal purposes. <laughs> like W.C. Fields used to say about alcohol, it's medicinal. Only. <laughs> um, and I went, ended up back in Ann Arbor where I'd gone to college, University of Michigan, and started doing plays just because that my, I drove a Jeep from the East Coast where I lived. I was headed back to Oregon, but my Jeep broke down in Ann Arbor. Mm -hmm. So I stayed there for a while, got a couple of jobs teaching school and doing other things and uh, did plays and uh, got got hooked again. And then I got a job in a professional theater in Milwaukee, a full season. But in terms of taking it seriously as a career, up until I'd been in New York for five, almost six years, and I was finally cast in a play on Broadway or at Lincoln Center called Streamers, directed by Mike Nichols, I was really just doing it for the fun. Mm -hmm. It was fun. They paid me money. They were nice. I didn't do any movies or TV. I refused to do them. I really just wanted to do theater. But around, I'd been doing it five or six years. I was close to, I was 30 something years, almost 30 years old. Got asked to do a movie in uh, England called Julia, directed by Fred Zinnemann. And I thought, well, I guess people think I'm pretty good at this. And it is fun to do. I like going into a room with a bunch of people and making up stories and and acting out stories and uh, pretending and and they pay you they pay you pretty good money and then when they get you when you start doing movies when you finally say yes I had to say yes when Fred Zinnemann asked me to do this movie because Fred Zinnemann was Fred Zinnemann directed High Noon he directed the first movie that Marlon Brando ever did the first movie that Mar Monty Clift ever did first movie that I ever did but I was cut out of it just 10 days before it opened I'm still in the credit and that was when I started to really say well I guess this is this is what I'm doing I'm not going to go back to school and become a marine, marine biologist, which is what I always threatened to do, or get back to Oregon and buy and get a gas station and or run a gas station up near a ski, a ski area so I could ski every day and, and pump gas for a living. Those, was, those were the options. The, doing the theater, doing movies, doing television, that seemed like a better option. So I did it. I'd say it worked out for you. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, it's interesting. You used the word career and now career, everybody talks about career. When I was coming up in New York, and this was the se early the 70s, throughout the 70s and the 80s, people didn't talk really about their, their, some people did. People like Jimmy Woods would talk for hours about his career. Most people didn't. They were just talking about the work and they were just interested in the work. What play are you doing? What's the, what film are you doing? And mostly what play are you doing? And what's it about? And how are you doing? How are you approaching? It was just, it was about the, it was about the work career came later because career implies that when you're doing one job you're thinking about the next job and that's counterproductive so what was your hesitation initially with uh, film and tv roles were you just not interested i just wasn't interested i really loved the theater i loved the literature of the theater i you know i'd come up on doing shakespeare and Chekhov and ibsen and tennessee williams and and uh, uh, arthur miller and people like you know american playwrights you you know the global playwrights and the literature, the nuance is uh, is better. And in the theater, you go into a room with a bunch of people for about four weeks, usually four weeks, five weeks, sometimes seven weeks, sometimes less. And you rehearse and you you talk about it. You investigate each other's lives and what do you think this character is? And you talk about it. 
in the movies and television, television in particular, you could show up in the morning, six o'clock to get makeup and hair and sitting in a chair next to you as a woman who's going to be playing your wife in the scene and a scene about when she tells you that she's fallen in love with a pool boy and after 16 years of marriage, she wants a divorce. And you, you, that's the first time you met her. And while you're staring at yourself in the mirror and they're putting makeup on you and fixing your hair and you look out of the corner of your eye at her and try to have a conversation two hours and you go back to your trailer and she goes back to her trailer and two hours later you're on the set and you're you're acting out this scene where she's telling you you know enough of you right. you're a club <laughs> i want out and you've got to make that up and it's easier it's easier actually to, to go into a room and talk it out with people you can find better stuff and the other thing that a friend of mine told me when I, the second play I ever got paid to do, as you like it, director named Tim Mayer, one of the smartest directors I ever met, great guy, he's dead now. But he said, he asked me, he said, what's the difference between acting in the theater and acting in movies? And I said, well, I don't know, one of them's live and one of them is uh, not. And he said, well, you're close because the difference is in the theater, you can be shot. And that puts an edge on it. Because it's true, you can be shot. People can throw things at you. People, I've had people throw when I'm doing streamers on Broadway. Some people threw their programs at me on the stage as I was dying on the stage, blood coming out of my mouth. Oh, there's Angelique. Just yeah. Angelique's name. <laughs> Startled. <laughs> about blood coming out of my mouth, and there's Angelique. <laughs> That's our cue. <laughs> um, so that so that was part of it too. The theater is so much more exciting because you can be shot. Of course, you can shoot them too, but you're it's alive. That's the right. point. It's alive, and it happens right now, and then it's gone. The food's better in the movie business and television business. Uh, it looks more glamorous. It's not really. It's it's hard work and hard work, like I said, because you've got to dredge up these emotional these emotions without a lot of preparation if, if you've got a good director who's made a lot of movies and successful movies they can get some time to rehearse i produced a movie called chili scenes of winter and we we managed to eat with joan mcman silver directed it and john hurd was in it mary beth hurd it's a nice little movie and we had two weeks where we were able to sort of rehearse with the actors because we were using mostly stage actors. John was had a big stage background. Mary Beth had a big, Peter Rieger had a stage and improv background. So anyway, that's it. That's that. That's why I, I still to this day prefer acting in the theater to acting in movies. Sometimes you hit one nice and Animal House was really a fun shoot. And, and Buffy the Vampire Slayer was really good writing. Lots of good nuance in the in the writing and the great mm -hmm. character. And occasionally you get lucky. Seinfeld, I did some side, a couple of Seinfeld episodes. A guy called the Maestro, and that was really good writing. I mean, I think the fact that people are still still turn it on and get it on TV uh, sort of two or three times a day, if you want to, if anybody actually watches regular TV anymore. <laughs> occasionally you get one of those good ones, but a lot of times, especially a guy like me who doesn't have perfect cheekbones or great teeth or great hair, you end up be, you know, sitting in the back corner of the room and you'll get two or three lines or a little scene now and again. A friend of mine calls them hat rack parts and uh, you'd just be the hat rack for the star. Denzel Washington is up here and you're in the back just sort of going, yeah, what did he say? Hmm, wow. <laughs> it doesn't, be, doesn't make for an interesting day at work. Right. That sort of segues into my next question. If you're on stage or if you're on screen, is your approach different to the character? The approach is the same in terms of what preparation. I try to prepare myself as much in terms of imbue myself as much with the place and the time. If it's a period piece, if I'm playing a guy like the master in Buffy the Vampire Slayer, who's 800 years old and has been living underground for a long time, I just try to live underground. No, I, I mean, I try to immerse myself in the in the reality of the character as much as I can and listen to music that he might listen to, listen to music that he might hear in his head, read books that he might read. I just try to sort of cover myself in the character. And I do that on film or on in the theater. The uh, advantage, as I said earlier, in the theater is that you get to rehearse. You get to work with the actors and try different things. In movies and television, you don't get to. You maybe do five takes if you're doing TV, 60 takes if you're working with Stanley Kubrick, which I've never done. But so, And every one of those is, is a chance to rehearse and try something different. So you try a lot of different stuff. The difference, Dirk Bogard, who was a wonderful English actor, once said that the difference between acting on stage and acting in the movies is that on stage, you're making love to this gigantic creature. And in the movies, you're making love to a lens. The difference between 
a big audience out there and and this little tiny thing here that sees everything so you do have to bring it down you have to internalize it a lot more i got in a lot of trouble early times i was acting because i was acting like it was on the stage it was too big i was acting for the eighth row in the in the orchestra instead right. of for this little lens that was right here it's a question of degree i guess and it's a very tricky thing and interesting thing and the people who do it really well who really internalize it well can do with just the movement of their eye what i might do on a whole cross across the state whatever whatever i'm trying to say or trying to express about the character there's a big difference but and that's it that's all i can say it's a question of scale i guess gotcha well said so how did the opportunity for animal house come about i had said yes to i'd finally broken my hymen as it were and done uh, this movie julia and had come back from there. And I had just prior to that done this play on uh, in, at Lincoln Center streamers that every, everybody, literally everybody saw. It was a huge hit. And uh, all kinds of people came from Hollywood to see it. And Mike Nichols had directed it. So, he, you know, he has had his whole crew of friends and everybody who loved Mike Nichols. And he was, you know, great, great director, second smartest director I ever worked. So I was able to get scripts beforehand. And I got the script for Animal House. And my agent said, I'm going to send you up for the part of Otter, Tim Matheson character. I right. said, oh, good. I read the script. And I said, oh, good. That's the guy that gets all the girls. That's, that'll be fun. <laughs> and uh, as soon as I walked in the room, and I've told this story, probably everybody's heard this story a hundred times. As soon as I walked in the room, John Landis looked at me and said, do you know how to ride? And I knew exactly what he was talking about. He was talking about the character Niedermeyer because I'd read the script and I knew he rode a horse. And I said, do I know how to ride? Of course, I know how to ride. I was practically born on a horse. My mother's <laughs> water broke when she was out on a trail rally and ride on her ranch in Montana. And she slid off the horse. My father got down and shaded the horse. He delivered me, he delivered calves. He could deliver me. And we got back on the horse and rode back down. I was just about born riding. And Landis looked at me and said, yeah. Right. I told him five more lies about how I knew how to ride and had been riding all my life. And uh, the next day he called me and said, I want you to do this part. And I said, great, John, thank you. Uh, do you think you can get some money out of Universal so I can learn how to ride? I'd ridden horses, but I, I didn't really know how to ride. I just was lying as best I could. And I think John liked the fact that I, I lied transparently. So what was the set like there? You know, you got yourself, Kevin Bacon, Belushi, Tim oh, Matheson. Oh, yeah. Was it wild? Donald Sutherland. It was yeah. pretty wild for them because I, I was an Omega, so I didn't participate in the the Delta House festivities, which went on just about every night in Bruce McGill's room. He stole a pin. Bruce stole a I knew Bruce from New York, bars in New York. And from doing plays in New York, but he stole a piano or borrowed a piano from the lobby of the Roadway Inn in Eugene, Oregon, where we shot it, put it in his room. And that became party central. And I asked, I went to the hotel and asked them to change my room so that my room was right above McGill's room because I knew that I would never get any sleep because they would be down there partying till two, three in the morning. And I, so I would stay up late at night, spit polishing my boots, my riding boots, studying my script and getting madder and madder at these guys down below who were keeping me up all in the name of this immersive so-called method acting that, that, that I'm accused of doing. So I didn't, I didn't have the party time that they did. I had a great time because I loved to work and it was a great character. And it was Eugene, Oregon, which is a really nice town, old hippie town, lots of old hippies there. Ken Kesey was still around in those days, I think. And I made some friends up the, up the river, up the Mackenzie River who had a ranch and they had about five or six horses. So I could, every day I didn't work or if I didn't work in the morning, I could go out there and ride their horses and practice what I'd learned. And that was fun. because I, I just, I had to go out in the field and, find my horse and put a halter on him and then get to tack him up and then go out and ride. Sticking on Nina Meyer, sort of, uh, did you have any idea who Twisted Sister was when you got approached to do that, those videos? No, uh -uh. When I, when Twisted Sister called me in 1984, I guess when they called me to ask me to do the first video, I didn't know who Twisted Sister was. I didn't know. I didn't have a TV. I had a little black and white analog TV and I hardly ever watched it. I maybe watch a baseball game if there was a baseball game on. And the, and the last time I would say to people, I, I stopped listening to popular music when Beethoven died. <laughs> I didn't know anything about hair bands or anything. And MTV, I didn't know MTV. And they called me and asked me to do it. They, they had loved the character of Niedermeyer. And Dee would do the lines all the time. And there were a great bar band up and down the Hudson River and all over Long Island, New Jersey. And I found all this out later. And they, they called me and asked me if I could 
would like to do this video and I didn't really know what it was. I guess I probably did know what a music video was. But, you know, I said, well, yeah, I'm doing a play in New York and I've got a show on Sunday afternoon and then no show Sunday night, no show Monday, no show Tuesday. I've got to be here again Wednesday night. So if you can get me out to California, which is where they said they wanted to shoot it, and uh, are you going to pay me? And they said, yeah, oh yeah, we're going to pay you SAG. I knew it. I guess I knew it wasn't a Screen Actors Guild. It wasn't, they'd had no contract with Screen Actors Guild, but they agreed to pay me scale, which was 376 bucks or something like that and fly me out there and put me up give me a place to stay now the place that they gave me to stay was marty colner's couch marty <laughs> colner was the director so i slept on his couch and d d snyder picked me up at the airport i never met him before and here's this big six foot three inch blonde <laughs> crazy person who picks me up and i said well, okay this will be fun rock and roll for sure I knew what rock and roll was, but I didn't know what hair bands were. On the way into to Marty Colner's house to uh, meet everybody else, D said, okay, here's the story. It's like a, a Roadrunner cartoon and you're Wiley Coyote and the band is the Roadrunner and all kinds of things happen to you. And, da, da, da. and But first, we're going to open it with you screaming at your son. So you've got to write what you, what you scream what you're going to yell at them and use some animal house stuff if you can. And all, all we ask is that it end with what do you want to do with your life? And uh, that's our catchphrase. So I went home and went and got a friend of mine, Rex Weiner, and we wrote this thing out six months later. It was playing every five minutes on MTV. <laughs> Did and you get radio stations all the way all over the country with my, with the stuff that I wrote at the beginning? They didn't just play the song. They played. Uh, I, I carried an M16 in the war, and you carried that that electric twanger or whatever it is. <laughs> That's the line. I've seen that yeah. video a lot. That's exactly it. <laughs> yeah. Of course, you were in Animal House before that. Yeah. Once that video dropped, did you just get recognized on every street corner by the, as the Twisted Sister guy? Yeah, as as animal as Niedermeyer and as the twi Twisted Sister guy. Yeah, I, I lived on the east in the East Village, St. Mark's Place between First and A. So I'd walk across to go to go to the gym or go to auditions. I'd walk across to the subway at Cooper Square. And, uh, can't I even remember now? I haven't been gone so long. I can't remember what train <laughs> I'd catch. But anyway, walking right down St. Mark's Place, which still in those days was had a lot of leftover hippies and a lot of heroin addicts and people crashing in doorways it was a fun place to be so there are a lot of homeless people and every time i'd walk across in front of the gem spa heading up past the electric circus somebody would say you're worthless and weak <laughs> or else they'd say what do you want to do with your life and i'd look around and like why are they yelling at me i didn't get it because i was already on doing my next play or doing whatever was next so and but, here you um, are america's angry dad <laughs> now yes and now i've become america's angry dad <laughs> the uh yeah i, I made a little uh, somebody a great wonderful woman named vera brunner sung made a documentary about me and about my career and about being stereotyped or typecast as America's Angry Dad and a couple of the review and it plays you can you can access it on uh, YouTube on the New Yorker magazine documentary or film channel if you just type in Mark Metcalf character is the name of it or New Yorker character mm -hmm. it's a it's a nice little short 17 minute short documentary of just me talking and pictures of me she did a good job of it uh, but I talk a lot about that about being top and the reviews all say yeah America's angry dad America's uh, <laughs> reluctant authoritarian or something like that you mentioned Seinfeld earlier uh, by the time you got on the show that was 95 96 I think I think it was in 96. I thought it was 97. I can't yeah. remember. Okay. By that time, I'm sure Seinfeld was already the phenomenon, oh, you know, number one. On the, yeah. So you had, a, you were aware of that going into the uh, episodes. Yeah. I didn't want, I didn't watch the show myself necessarily. I had a young son and I pretty much watched cartoons with him, <laughs> but I knew, I knew of Seinfeld and I knew how big it was. And yeah. They were, they were already making $600,000 every four days. Cause that's how long it took to shoot an episode. Was, four days. was it a fun experience for you? Did you hang around? Oh, yeah. yeah. We didn't hang out a lot. It was pretty professional. People sort of showed up, did their job and what, but it was, it was a fun room. I mean, the nice thing about doing those sitcoms, three camera, now four camera sitcoms is that you do you do it, spend a day doing a table read where you just sit around and read and try different things out. And then the writers go away and write, you know, they change it based on what you brought to it and what you think and what they see of you. And then you come back and the next day you do a table read again, and then you start to get it up on the feet. So it's a slow process. You start on Monday and on Thursday on Seinfeld anyway, on Thursday, 
is when we would perform it in the late afternoon at five o'clock. So we had some of that rehearsal time because comedy takes precision and it's nice to work with people who are who are good at it and you don't just get to work. And they all really got to work. We didn't really hang out. We didn't go out to a bar afterwards or we went, uh, you know, had lunch one, I think on Thursday, they didn't, they let us go. Usually they bring you lunch and uh, on the set. But I think on that Thursday, we got to, we, we had a two hour break or an hour and a half break. And we all went out to a Thai restaurant and sat around and ate. So it's, you know, and they're good guys. I, I'd, I'd known Jason vaguely before from New York and, uh, Julia, I didn't know, but she was great. Michael Richards a little edgy and a little crazy, but he was, you know, he was a good comedian. He was fun to work with. And Jerry just was enjoying the whole thing so much. I mean, you can see him cracking up because <laughs> he thinks all these people around him are so funny. I got yep. to know Larry David a little bit. He wasn't in it, but he uh, was a writer and a producer at that time still. I think that was his la last year as a producer. And he dropped right. out or maybe the next year. He told me we had a conversation once uh, and he was say saying that he was a little bit tired of being sort of standing behind Jerry all the time. And he liked Jerry. They're still good friends and everything, but he uh, wanted to try something on his own. And there he is with Curb Your Enthusiasm a couple of years later. Another hit. Yeah, another mm -hmm. giant hit. Mm -hmm. I think about the same time that you did Seinfeld, you also did Buffy. Kind of helped jump that uh, show off with the first major art. You had a lot of makeup. I think you said you stayed five hours in the makeup chair for the master. Oh, for Buffy? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it was five hours. Uh, I, I would. I did a couple of 22-hour days. They wanted to shoot everything with a master in as few days as they could because it was so expensive to spend all this time putting the makeup on and to build this stuff. So we would do some long, long days. And yeah, five hours at the beginning because we didn't know. They had. They just had the map, the, the very, very thin foam, really wonderful stuff that picks up lots of different facial expressions. But they didn't really know what colors they wanted to do, so they would glue it on me and the skull cap. It was one piece in the mask, a piece for the skull cap, a piece for the neck, and then the two ears. So one, two, three, four, five pieces, and then the fingernails. But they would put it on and then they would paint it on me. And that was what really took all the time. And I couldn't, I could talk when they gave me a chance to talk. I'd say, could you maybe a little more purple over here or something like that? They were, they were really wonderful and collaborative. Again, I love people who collaborate. Mm -hmm. you know who say so what do you think and and, and i can say oh, this i think this do we try can we try this and we'll try that and then we, if, eventually if you watch the series the first season if you binge watch it from the first episode through you can see the colors evolving to whereby near the end i've got that what she calls a punch bowl mouth mm -hmm. where my mouth because that, <laughs> yeah. that wasn't true at the beginning but by the end we had evolved this thing where it just like he's been sucking blood for so long his my face is just stained yeah, yeah, I remember that line. Yeah, I think I saw a previous interview that you were lobbying for less makeup because you wanted uh to take a Nosferatu style approach. To oh, the master. right, yeah, right. Joss's idea for the master was sort of long, black, dirty hair, stringy hair, a little Keith Richardsy kind of. In my mind, it was Keith Richardsy. And I, as part of my research, when they cast me, I started, I went back to watch the original vampire movie, Nosferatu, which I believe is the original one. And I watched that. I watched the great, really great, oh, what's it called? Shadow of a Vampire with Malkovich and Willem yeah. Dafoe, mm, mm. The, uh, the making of, of great Nosferatu. Movie. Yeah. And I came to Josh and I said to him, maybe, I think, what if we make him look a little bit like Nosferatu, where we do, you know, the baldness and sort of bird-like and just so that we can hearken back to the history, the cinematic history of, of vampires. And uh, he liked that idea. And so we went with that. So they, they set the makeup up that, that way, took away the hair. And, and I ended up in five hours of makeup instead of all the other vampires just have, you know, one piece right here. But I had to go be covered with a bald cap and everything because I didn't want to shave my head. I guess I would have shaved my head, but they didn't <laughs> ask me to. So. <laughs> I yeah. don't like I don't like the Abercrombie and Fitch vampires. From, from, okay, uh, gotcha. From I, like, <laughs> I like I, I like the old school ones. Vampires sucking somebody's blood and giving them eternal life is, is a mean thing to do. It's not it's not like a great thing to do. None of us really wants to live forever because it just we get yeah no I yeah no so I like the old school. I like the mean ones. I like the brutal. I like the brutal ones. I like the uh, they're charming. I mean, uh, what's his name? Uh, Gary Oldman in the in the Dracula. 
in Dracula, in, in, yes. uh, in Bram Stoker's Dracula, Coppola directed. He's great. As weird and operatic as he is, he's also very charming. Right. And uh, so, you know, if you want to really be evil, and that's, you know, that's the idea, in 800 years old, perfect evil, um, you've got to be uh, charming. You've got to get people to want to come sit next to you. So you got to be nice. And then you bite them on the neck. <laughs> <laughs> I say it's like uh, Buffy... Since you got you guys kind of helped start off that show on the right foot with a serious first art, you and Brian Thompson. Uh, yeah, what another great. Have you worked with him since those days? No, I've I've been to a couple of conventions with him. One in England, I know, and I think one over here, maybe Chiller, where he's been there. But I haven't worked done other stuff with him. He's a nice guy, good guy. Right. Yeah, I, I was just making a comment that you two guys together, sort of, even though those are roles that don't appear past the first season, I don't believe you kind right, of help no. jumpstart the show. Yeah, I I always say. Uh, after the first season, the show went downhill. Well, I, it's interesting. I mean, it didn't go downhill. It really, it stayed good. It ran, it really is an iconic television show. But I do think that the first season, when nobody knew that it was a hit and nobody was running off to do interviews, everybody was sort of in the same boat. We're just having fun making the story up. Uh, I think there's, you get, you, you get a little bit more creative in a really organic deep way uh when you're when everything's on the line mm -hmm. and then when you start winning it gets a little easier you take it a little easier and you step back a little bit i mean i i mean i i'm not maligning joss and i mean those guys and what's his name david greenberg was he the uh i believe yeah uh, the other producer and i mean those guys did they worked hard every day and uh but something is something gets taken away when you become from the process when you have to start doing interviews when you have to break when when Sarah Michelle has to have to be off uh, has to be broken by four o'clock because she's got to do an interview for Cosmopolitan or some some magazine and that when I came back I came back and did Angel I came back and did an episode in the third season when it was already a big hit and they were. They were really hunting for ideas that, that, what was it called? The dream or something, the wish. Some character had made the wish that Buffy had never come to Sunnydale. Yeah. So they did an episode where the, the master was basically the mayor of Sunnydale. And then I came back and did one scene in the, in the seventh, in the final, uh, final season. I think it was the seventh season. I can't remember. It had changed. The whole, the whole tenor tone on the set had changed. And that tone, the first season, was like I said, we, we, we knew we were doing something that was really good good script it was fun it, there was irony in it there was and we also knew that we were it was the first time that a woman really was given the power of life and death i guess wonder woman she was too but the way we did buffy was a little bit more less cartoony a little bit more realistic so there was a kind of an empowering of, of women at the time uh, that we were doing so we knew we were doing something that had a, an important theme an important political not a message but just this important vibe that was going on and it was fun writing i mean doing something like that and saying oh, you've got something in your eye and sticking my finger in the guy's eye to kill him. <laughs> Even though it happens off stage is, a, you know, it's, it's very funny. So when you do come back for Angel, is there any more of that? Is there any remnants of that Buffy set or feeling left over? Except for Julie Benz, uh, who was a, a wonderful actress and a wonderful, really wonderful woman. And working with her was really great because we'd, we'd sort of touched base a little bit during that first season, but coming back to do Angel where it was really more about how Angel was made and how she made him. And, that, and it was, for me, it was about our relationship and working with her was really great, but everything else was already into that. Yeah. I'm a star kind of thing. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, 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 the, and it was built around that. And, the, the, and it was a different, it was a different vibe. I was happy to do it. I was glad to do it. It got me out to LA and I saw some friends and they paid me American money. So. So Mark, I see that you used to run a program that teaches screenwriting to younger adults. I lived in Milwaukee and I finally, when I retired or resigned or quit, movie acting and television acting which turned out not to be true in two in 2000 and moved to wisconsin i bought a restaurant and uh started and they asked me to work come they asked me to come and do some promotional stuff for the milwaukee film festival and so i did that and i it was a good film festival and i liked the people that were doing it so I, I worked with them for a while and then they had this program that they were toying with doing and uh, I ended up calling it collaborative cinema and what we would do is we'd go to high schools all over the city 
and pitch this thing and say, you write us a one page treatment. This is what we call it in Hollywood, a treatment for a short film, a 10 minute film, five minute film, 14 minute film, but write it in, you got to write it in one page. We'll read all the submissions. We'll pick the best 50 and then we'll bring you those 50 down to a, a place that we'll find. We used a museum, uh, uh, the Discovery Museum in Milwaukee, the Science Museum for Kids. Uh, and we'll put you together with professional filmmakers and and college filmmaking students. But mostly we use professional filmmakers who lived in, in the area, screenwriters, directors, cinematographers. And we'll teach you how to turn this idea into a screenplay. So we taught them the format for screenplay. We taught them about how to introduce characters, how to introduce plot how to do, and how to just make it more exciting. You go, then those kids would all go away and they would write their first draft. And then we would come back and have another workshop, a, you know, a six hour long workshop. These kids would come and spend six hours with us and developing how to write the second draft, how to do, how to perfect this thing. And by that time you're working with a director and a cinematographer. And then we picked the best one and we made a movie out of it. So we made, wow. I ran that program for five years, I think six years, we made five or six uh, short films that are, I'm, I'm quite proud of. There's some of them really good. I think they're, I don't know if they're available anywhere, but, That's cool. but they're good and worked with, you know, yeah. worked with good people. And to your knowledge, but, did any of those students go on to become screenwriters? Did you know? uh, yeah, I, I've kept, I haven't kept in touch still to date, but for the, for the first five or six years after the program, after I left the program, and then they, the Milwaukee Film lost faith in the program and closed it down, which is unfortunate. Yeah, I kept in touch with several of them, maybe five or six that uh, that went into the business and are still in the business. None of them are sitting there next to Will Smith at the Oscars, but uh, that's probably good for their face. Yeah, yeah that'll be better. <laughs> it'll be better for their career that they weren't next to him. Um, but. Uh, <laughs> But they're but they're in the business. They're craftsmen. They're good craftsmen, and they're working hard. And a lot of the people that uh, one of the one of the directors that I worked with, who was a, started out as a cinematographer, and he teaches at Milwaukee, University of Wisconsin Milwaukee in their film school, which is a really good film school. I've made two feature films with him, Little Red and uh, The Field. Is it called The Field? Yeah, I think it's called The Field two films with him that I'm very happy with and proud of. They're just low budget independent films, which again, talking about that first season of Buffy, I much prefer now if I'm going to do film work to work with on low budget independent films, because everybody's really hungry and right. working with very little material, like in the corner of their apartment where you are and we're trying to make a movie and we're trying to do something. And it's, it, it you just, it forces you to be creative in ways that you might not. I mean, I understand having two hundred twenty-five million dollars and how much fun that might be to spend <laughs> that. But it, but it's also fun to try to do it for a million dollars. Right, right. See how creative you can be. That's how you get folks like Roger Corman. You know, just trying to do what you can with what you got. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Every, and everybody started out that way. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, Mark, if you could go back and have a second crack at a at a role or change something about a previous project, what, what would that be? Oh, wow. Gosh, that's a good question. I never played Hamlet. I've done oh. four Hamlets, but never played Hamlet. I'd like to, I'd like to play Hamlet and do it as a memory play. So I'm, you know, I'm 80 years old and yeah. I'm remembering what it was like to be uh, 17 and have my, my father die and my mother marry my uncle right away and, and find out that, yeah, that would be fun to do. Uh, I played Romeo in Romeo and Juliet with Kate Burton, and uh, I would like to do it as a memory play, too. I'm too old to play Romeo anymore, but I could do it. As, and I think it'd be Jer Jerzy Krotowski, a great Polish director, had this idea of Romeo and Juliet as a memory play. Two 85-year-old couple, an 85-year-old couple, man and woman, who were sitting around uh, just not getting along with each other and haven't gotten along with each other for 60 years, remembering falling in love. And mm -hmm. how the how the love consumed them and ate them up, and they ended up hating each other, or dying in their memory. That's when the love mm -hmm. died. And do it as a memory play, which would be fun to try to structure and do. I'd like to do that. But it's film and TV roles. I don't know. I think I I feel like I got as much out of the master as I could get. I mean, if they were to reboot it and bring the master back, I'd be happy to do it because I think there's more. But there'd be more. There'd be new writing, and there'd be there could be more to do. 
I'd like to see the master run for president. Or hey, no, me too. Uh, the, ma the master could be uh, Stephen Miller, who was Donald Trump's sort of yeah. fascist, fascist in residence. Um, <laughs> that would be the master for yeah. Donald Trump. I'd that's be the guy one. behind. Yeah, I was going to say, but behind the scenes would be better because that's where all the action takes place. That, that's where <laughs> that's where the real stuff. Yeah. And then I sort of working Donald Trump's mouth and helping him with his comb over. <laughs> Oh, five hours man. of makeup indeed <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> now how long do you suppose it takes him to get his hair just like that <laughs> <laughs> so is it safe to say that hamlet is your favorite play then Haber hamlet is a shakespeare i love shakespeare and hamlet is a is a favorite play one of the my favorite plays that i've done and played a main part in I played Claudius twice, Laertes once with Chris Walken, um, and what else? Oh, and Marcellus. Those are the four Hamlets that I've done. But uh, Long Day's Journey Into Night, played by Eugene O'Neill, about uh, Eugene O'Neill's family. I don't know if you know the play. It's really one of the great American dramas. Mar Marlon Brando used to say, there's acting, and then there's acting in O'Neill. Because O'Neill plays are just so deep and dark and painful and suffering and alcoholics and morphine addicts and people who have just seen it all and come right. back and yeah and and so it's fun that it's it was fun. i loved i had a i did a good production of long day's journey into night and uh, i actually i would like i'd like to play i played the youngest son edmund the eugene o'neill character now i'm probably a little bit too old but i'd uh, i wouldn't mind playing the old the old man who's a drunk irish actor all right mark so what's the best advice you've received in your career Mike Nichols, who I mentioned before, directed me in streamers, said to me at one point, you're an actor, act like you're a good one. <laughs> oh, that's, yeah, that's a good one. There you go. <laughs> I, think, I think he was trying to put me down. He was always trying to put me down. But, um, but I, it actually, it's good advice because uh, I'm an actor. And if I can't figure out what to do or how to do it, I think, let's see, how would Robert De Niro do it? How would Paul Schofield do it? Try it in a way a different couple of different people would do it and do it. It's like Jackson Pollock didn't just start out dripping paint all over the place. He started out painting and he had heroes and he uh, can't remember who is. A lot of his realistic or semi-realistic uh, early paintings were after, what's that guy's name? I can't remember. But there's a painter that he's, he's not, it's not mimicking him, but he's just sort of painting his style and you learn how the brush works. He's inspired by him. Yeah, he was, he was inspired by him. Yeah. If you're uh, an actor and you can't figure out how to do this one part, just do it the way somebody, Robert, how would Bobby Duvall do it? Theater and movies is a very immersive experience. What's your favorite movie snack? You know, that, that perfect thing for you to munch on? Water. I don't, <laughs> I try not to eat while I'm working because my body, for some reason, my metabolism works really hard digesting food. So I'll eat fruit at the craft service table, but the craft service table can kill you. I mean, if it's a really boring job, then you'll go and you'll eat all the candy bars and donuts and everything. But <laughs> but if you've got to work, I try not to eat. I, I'll eat a little fruit because it's easily digestible and gives you energy. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I drink a lot of water. <laughs> when I was doing the master, uh, and I had these fingernails on, I, I drank a lot of water because you know, once, I, I, once I had the makeup on, I couldn't really eat anything mm -hmm. because I didn't want to mess up the makeup. So right. no snacks. But I did drink a lot of water with a straw. But consequently, I had to pee fairly often. <laughs> And I always seemed to have to pee and I had these nails on and I couldn't get the, the zipper down and couldn't get my stuff out to pee with. <laughs> um, so I had to go to wardrobe and get somebody from wardrobe. And there was a very nice young woman whose name I can't remember, unfortunately, who would help me with that. And she would, she would do it for me because I couldn't with my nails. God bless that Without wardrobe lady. <laughs> <laughs> That, but so, yeah, so I don't really, I don't have a snack. That's an interesting question. <laughs> Do you have a sponsor? I could say that. Guys, Kit Kat is, oh, I love Kit Kat. We'll try. You know, <laughs> they're not yet. We'll try oh, Kit Kats now. We'll try well, Kit Yeah, Kats. I'm pitching you for Kit Kats now. Call All them right. up and tell them we, I gave them, the master gave Kit Kats a good, yeah, the master loves Kit Kats. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Mark, not gonna like I said, not gonna keep you all morning. Do you have anything on, in the pipeline? Anything on the horizon for you? No, yourself? I'm kind of I'm kind of at, at liberty. So if anybody's got a job, I'm free. I'm 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 essentially retired, but I love to work. And I uh, I just moved to Portland, or I live in Portland, Oregon now. And I uh, 
moved here about a year ago in the middle of COVID and everything sort of obviously ground to a halt during COVID. Now it's getting back up. When I was in Ohio, I was in Columbus, Ohio before, and I started dancing again. I danced a little bit when I was younger and I danced, I worked in, in uh, Ohio in Columbus with this wonderful woman, Chloe Napolitano, and she's about 25 and she's a really good dancer and a great teacher. And I, she taught a class for people who are over 50. And then she came to me and said, would you like to make a dance with me? And I said, yes, I would. Because I danced as a young actor in New York. I danced with Eric Hawkins a little bit, modern dance. So she and I devised this one really wonderful dance where I played an old lady and she played a young girl. And it was really fun. And then COVID came along. We were supposed to perform it at the uh, Wexner Art Center in uh, Columbus there on the big stage. And uh, uh, then COVID came along and everything got canceled and we haven't done it. We've never done it. Hopefully anyway. that gets revived somehow. Well, she, she's ta- she still lives in Columbus and I live here, but she still talks every once in a while about wanting to do it. We, we may figure out a way to do it. We'll see. She's coming out here to visit in a, in a month, about a month, I think. Two months. Yeah, but nothing else. So anybody has a job, I'm, I'm available. You heard that there, folks. Hit the master yeah. up. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Mark, it's Hook been a pleasure master talking to you. Right. <laughs> it's been a pleasure talking to you, man. And thank you so much. You too. Thanks a lot. Thank, thank you. you. Good luck with this. Send me a, a link to when it's going to, when it, where and how, and I'll put it on my Facebook page. I don't do much uh, promotion, self promotion, but I do have a Facebook page and I'll put it up there. Will do, my you? friend. Thank yeah, you so much. Absolutely. All right. Well, good. Thanks a lot. Thank you, I'm, Mark. Uh, I'm going to leave now. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye. Get out of here. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the night. You think you know Night Demon? Then the Night Demon Heavy Metal Podcast is for you. Step into the darkness as we peel back the curtain to give you an unprecedented, all access look into the mind and the heart of the demon. We're talking band history, song analysis, studio anecdotes, stories from the road. It's everything a diehard Night Demon fan could want and more. This is the only place to learn the inside scoop, the deep dive trivia, the untold tales from the band members themselves and those closest to the Night Demon story. Need more? The sacred Night Demon crypt will be pried open to reveal demo recordings that have never before seen the light of day. All with in-depth commentary by the band and the people who were there for the writing and recording process. This is a gold mine. A treasure trove of all things Night Demon. Head over to nightdemon.net or wherever you listen to podcasts. Listen to podcasts. Listen to podcasts.